Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon. Thank you for coming here. It's an honor to me to introduce Olivier Danvi. Olivier is a professor at the University of Aarhus. He made several important works in, uh, in the field of primary languages, and mainly in the partial evaluation and continuation. And personally, when I was undergraduate, I really appreciate, really loved. One of my favorite papers was the one of, uh, on uh, type direct partial evaluation. And uh, he gives very nice, very good talks. He also have this meta talks in which he gives talks on how to give talks. And uh, I think also you are one of, uh, you are the most thanked computer scientists in the world. So on one database. On one database, but anyway, na according to nature, so. Yeah, all right, so, okay. So enjoy the speaker, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So, um, this is my first talk at Microsoft, so I have to compose myself. So this is, this is a short title, and it's, it's, it's a, the, the whole point is a little bit like Isaac Asimov saying that uh, scientific progress is not like, aha, I have found it, Eureka. It's much more like, hmm, that's funny, and then you go from there. So this talk is, a, is like that. So it's a joint work with Ken Chan from Rutgers, and my new PhD student, Jan Zorani from Aarhus University, and we presented uh, a version of that at DSL, which was the IFIP Working Conference on Domain-Specific Languages three weeks ago. So here is the full title. J is for JavaScript, a direct style correspondence between algol-like languages and JavaScript using first-class continuations. So it's one of these titles where you have to explain on when you have finished to explain it, you're in the middle of the talk, so the rest is easy. So that title is a reference to a historically important paper by Peter Landin that was published in 1965, which was called A Correspondence Between Algol 60 and Church Lambda Notation. So our paper is a direct style correspondence between algol-like language and JavaScript using process continuations. And we have a message, which is that it works. So w in short, we could retarget the output of the embedding into JavaScript, and it works. So now I'm going to tell you in which sense it works and why. Sorry. So the paper, the presentation is in four uh, bullets. The first one is, I would like to tell you about Peter Landin. He's an important guy in programming languages, and he just passed away. So uh, there are some interesting things to say about him and his work. Then there is, uh, well, his point, as reflected here, which is the correspondence between uh, defined Ned language and defined Ning language in principle, as he did it. And then that corresponds in practice on why JavaScript uh, arrives as the, as the target language. Uh, and then I would like to have some technical perspectives. So that's the lessons that we have learned from, from that work. All right, so if you never heard of Peter London, you, you really should look him up because he has done really important things. He, he's one of the founding fathers of programming language as we know them today. Basically, everything Lambda in programming language kind of started with him. He, he, he opened the field of domain-specific languages in a famous paper called The Next 700 Programming Language in which he showed that that correspondence, that way of embedding languages into, into other languages could actually account for all the programming language in existence at the time, and the target language would be the lambda calculus, essentially. And uh, then he said that the next 700 programming language would be built like that. Historically, it's funny because it's a typo in the title, which was the next 100, and then the copy editor wrote 700, and he thought it was nice. So <laughs> and so uh, he, he died of cancer recently, a month ago, and so uh, for the next issue of Horsk, I have this uh, editorial, which is a tribute, and it tells more, more things about my personal experience with him. So if you're curious, you're welcome to read it. So uh, he had uh, an, an interest, so he, he's one of these guys who, who, who has interesting uh, uh, initials. 
uh, like PL for programming language. And it's, in, it's a little bit interesting to see people initial, like Peter Lee is also very fortunate. D Dana Scott is the notational semantics, and so is David Schmidt. And you can play the game, it's fun. So in, in some sense, the first half of his life, he was uh, an amazing computer scientist who bring, brought a, a very strong fresh wind into computer science, making introducing abstract machines, introducing functional programming, inventing closures, ev lazy evaluation, uh, how to uh, implement uh, recursion by uh, tying the knot, so self-reference uh, in, in the store, uh, and many, many astonishing things like that. And that kind of intellectual explosion went on basically until the mid-70s, where, well, he did what people do when they become academic. They served in program in PhD committees. And then as he was going in PhD committees, he realized that it was becoming ferociously theoretical and all the fun and practical fun that he usually had was kind of fading out. And then he radically turned away from, the, from everything. And uh, he worked as a full professor helping people and students, but not really doing research anymore. This was very bizarre. Instead, he turned to a political activist. And uh, the, from then on, he was like living in a commune and uh, participating in demonstrations and, and, and that kind of things, where he had the same, uh, the same well, non-standard views and provoking views and interesting views. And so last month, there was his, uh, his memorial. And so I went there. It was in London. And uh, the situation was very much like John von Heinenhort, whom you might have heard of in the second half of his life, where he was a uh, mathematical uh, logician. So he wrote a famous book called From Frege to Gödel, and then uh, making the, the foundations of everything cool in logic and the curry homomorphism and that kind of things. So, um, but in the first half of his life, he was a political activist. Actually, he was, uh, he was the bodyguard of uh, Trotsky, mm -hmm. which uh, is kind of unconventional for a mathematician. And so he, he stayed there up to two months before Trotsky's death, and then he had enough. So he went back to Paris, and then Trotsky was killed, so he felt bad about it. But OK, then he did some mathematical logic, beautiful work. Eventually, he died. And at his memorial, there were two very distant groups of people who came and who looked at each other and who say, well, who are you? <laughs> He's ours. So I felt exactly like that at Peter Landin's memorial because there were a group of people who are clearly political activists and people very engaged socially and blah, blah, blah. And then there was a group of very few of us who are computer scientists. Uh, and I tried to talk with, with others and it didn't really work. So um, the, th that was quite surprising. And conversely, some of the people he, wa he was living with thought that, ask him, why don't you have a laptop, like in 1999 or something? And Peter said, ah, nah. And so they, they really thought he was uh, technically uh, well challenged. And then when he died, they realized, wow, well, he was actually a brilliant computer scientist. That's amazing. So uh, a guy of extremes, but who had, uh, well, had enormously many things to say. And um, I, I met him. 10, 15 years ago, um, and I invited him to give a talk at the continuation workshop, a keynote speech. And uh, you can find more about that in my tribute. It's kind of amusing. And then I, I made him, I had him uh, become an advisory member of the journal so that he could get a free copy and stay in touch and that kind of things. And um, so he, he, he was a very keen man. All right, that was Peter Landin very quickly. Do notice that his name is Peter Landin, but there is a J in the middle. We'll come back to that. So at the time, he was using the, the Alfred Tarski-like idea of defining a language in terms of another language. So if you look, for example, in uh, John McCarthy's uh, early papers on towards uh, math uh, mathematics of computation and that kind of things, uh, Tarsk, uh, McCarthy is very defensive and protective of that idea. And he says, uh, it's actually an interesting idea. It's not, you're not defaulting into, uh, into uh, an undefined yet language to, to describe an existing language. Conversely, someone like Jean-Yves Girard is extremely critical of that idea. He says, uh, if you look at logic and the way Tarski defines and in terms of and, or in terms of or, not in terms of not, well, what have you defined? 
But the computer scientists say, well, wait a second, you start from a language and then you, you make successive versions of your compiler, which you compile with the previous version of the compiler, so that works. And this kind of uh, opposite view can be summarized as induction versus recursion. The, the computer scientist is inductive, he starts from what's known and then he constructs new things. The logician is afraid of recursion, of paradox, of self-reference and divergence. So here, the, the, the idea is taken in a constructive way. He wants to have already a language and then define a new language in terms of the other one. And so it's kind of known that if you write like a denotational semantics, the idea of denotation is, is, uh, is revealing that you express something in terms of what it means and that what it means is expressed in a language. So I regularly ask computer scientists whether for them denotational semantics is like an interpreter or like a compiler, and, 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 and the, the answer is very, very sharply divided. So the, the, the classical people will, will say, uh, of course it's a compiler. Uh, that's what it's called syntactic, syntax directed translation into the lambda calculus. And then you, you translate that into, into the lambda, lambda terms, and then there is a machine that will do the reduction, and in doing so, it will process the dynamic meaning of the, of the language. So that would be like, uh, Joe Stoy, Dave Schmidt, Peter Mosses, who made his PhD thesis on the first semantics implementation system, SIS, that was doing exactly that. And then at the turn of the 70s, there was a series of papers called the Lambda Papers by Steele and Sussman, in which they were writing Lambda interpreters right and left. And so all that generation of people who have seen that, they say, well, of course it's, it's an interpreter, because look, the, the text of the evaluation function is the definition of the interpreter. And then the interpreter that you write, there's a case on the syntax, and so it's an interpreter. And uh, then usually people uh, look at each other and don't really understand. Fortunately, there is partial evaluation. And partial evaluation is, uh, reconciles both points by saying that you can specialize an interpreter with respect to its source program, there, thereby translating from the source language to the meta language. And technically, it's called the first Futamura projection. There are two more. So it defines the same elephant. So what is the meta-language for Peter Landin? Well, for him it was what he called applicative expressions, which we know today as lambda terms, namely purely functional programs. And the technique that he was using was a compositional embedding. So today we would say, uh, Eric Meyer would say uh, a catamorphism. Uh, I'm sure he would use even better word, but catamorphism will do for here. So basically a recursive descent in the source syntax where every recursive call to the function is on a proper subpart of the, the syntax. So you can reason by structural induction on the input. That's the idea. So the challenge uh, at the time was that there were a syntactic construct called jumps go to. And um, well, you could just proscribe the problem by saying, well, it's harmful anyway, so you don't want to, to deal with them. Or you could say, well, can, can we find the compositional encoding of, of jumps? So the problem is that you have that list of statements, and so the, the compositional function is very clear. It's recursive descent on the list, and then the meaning of each of the statements is a composition of the meaning of each of the statements. But what about jumps? The jumps just say, well, it's not the rest of the list of statements, it's another one. And so people were, were, were scratching their head furiously and um, in order to find uh, a compositional meaning of language with go to, program with go-tos. Now, today the accepted solution is continuations. It's due to what's worth on straight sheet. The idea is to have a compositional embedding where every label in the source program is mapped into the declaration of the current continuation, so now you catch it, and every go-to is translated as applying the continuation that was declared with, with the corresponding label. And that signal the advent of so-called continuation passing style, because that kind of encoding is useful in many other settings. So continuation passing style, the acronym is due to Guy Steele, was used for the very first compiler for Scheme, which was called Rabbit. And it's the primary uh, architecture underlying the standard name of New Jersey by, by Andrew Appel. Uh, it was quickly felt that continuation passing style, besides having you know, too many lambdas. So Mozart was criticized by being told too many notes, and CPS people are criticized by saying too many lambdas. 
And uh, so about 15 years ago, in the turn of the 90s, there were a fraction of the CPS people who basically defected and said, well, actually, we do not need CPS. We can just just, just as well with uh, so-called monadic style and in non-type form, in normal forms. And then for 15 years, people were kind of arguing back and forth about naive or clever implementations until Andrew Kennedy, in a smashingly good paper uh, two years ago at ICFP, explained why he had recoded his entire compiler in two continuation passing style because it was just better. And he had lots of technical, technical reasons for that. And so, the, the, so that means that we're kind of still going backwards and forwards between should we use continuation passing style or not, independently of jumps. And so an alternative that I had been proposing at the beginning of the 90s was to make the CPS transformation selective. So it's kind of a Gedanken experiment. Imagine that you have read a book about denotational semantics once in your life, and you have these rather intimidating formal specifications, and one of them is called direct semantics, and another one is called continuation semantics. And then, uh, well, if you're like me, you, you wonder, well, couldn't we CPS transform one into the other? So now all the mathematicians raise their arm to the heaven and they say, well, you can't do that because you can only CPS transform programs. And semantics is mathematics, so you can't CPS transform mathematics. Path. So, uh, well, so second step, maybe we can CPS transform the representation of, the, of uh, semantics expressed as a functional program. And that actually works. Except that if you CPS transform a direct semantics, you don't really obtain a continuation semantics because there are too many lambdas. So, like, if you write the environment, it's never written in continuation passing style for something concrete. So, after some head scratching, uh, John Hetcliffe and I figured out that maybe uh, there would be some heuristics about, uh, well, improving the CPS transform, tuning it so that we could, we, well, we could do something better. So, an example is total functions. A total function will always return a result, and you usually use continuation passing to encode non-termination. So maybe you could generalize the CPS transform and make it selective so that you would only CPS transform functions that you know are not total or you don't know are total. So you leave the total function in direct style and you can play the same game for strict function or non-strict functions. And with this simple uh, heuristic, we were actually able to uh, obtain mechanically the continuation semantics that had been written by hand and, and published. And so 10 years later, Lassen Nielsen, uh, 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 the BRICS PhD school, um, extended that idea from totality or partiality to effects. And then the idea would be that if a function is, doesn't have any effect, well, then you do not need to CPS transform it. And then depending on the effect, you CPS transform this part of that part. And at ICFP, at the end of the month, uh, there is a paper by Martin Odersky and his students. I'm sorry, I don't remember their name, but Martin is the third author in which they, they show that if you take that idea of selective CPS transform for Scala, then he can smoothly integrate the, CP, the delimited continuations into Scala using essentially uh, the polymorphic version of the typing system that Andrzej Filinski and I presented a long time ago, made polymorphic by the likes of Kenichi Asai and Yo Yuki Yoshi Kameyama in Japan. So it's, it's a very nice story of of borrowing and building and climbing on each other's shoulders. It's so much to climb on each other's shoulders, so much nicer than climbing on each other's feet, if you think about it. So the accepted continuation now, okay? CPS. M every label is mapped to a binding that maps what's the current continuation, and every jump is mapped to a call to the, to the declared continuation. Uh, what Peter Landin did at the time was to actually extend the meta-language with a brand new invention at the time, which was a control operator. And so what a control operator is, is a meta-language op um, operation that captures the current continuation of the meta-language. Uh, and then he said, well, that's not complicated to, to encode algol into applicative expressions. <coughs> you map the labels to occurrences of J, which captures the current continuation, almost. <coughs> Sorry. And then you map jumps to calls to program closures. So the advantage is that you have a very direct style encoding. Uh, 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 the, the, the structure of the Algol 60 program remains in the structure of the lambda resu re resulting lambda terms. It's a direct style embedding. Now, he was also known, uh, Peter Landin, to have said uh, in the mid-70s, in a meeting apparently famous where Cliff Jones attended, 
in, in which he said, well, by now we are sufficiently familiar with the concept of assignment that you guys should in integrate it into your, into your meta-language and specification language. So imagine UML with assignments, for example. So the, the, the difference between continuation passing style is that the meta-language is used to encode a lot of uh, jumping uh, on declarations, whereas here the, the structure, the lexical structure in particular, remains the same. But then for jumps, you use meta-level operations. So the reference of that is a correspondence between Algol 60 and Church Lambda notation, which was the first historically embedding of uh, a language into, into the Lambda calculus. So what does J stands for? Well, J is ostensibly for jump. On the other hand, if you look a little bit between the words, you see that, uh, so it's a quote, from, misquote from Shakespeare, what's in a name? So that's Romeo and Juliet. So here I'm asking, what's in the middle name? And then I find a very suspicious J, which stands for John. And so I thought it was funny when I introduced Peter London at the continuation workshop in 97 in Paris. And I said, well, Peter London is the only computer scientist who has a control operator as his middle name. And I thought, am I being so funny, so witty? And then he looked at me with very piercing eyes, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is not a coincidence that he called it J. But we never really talked about it. So you have Peter Landin as the guy who introduced the idea of embeddings. I've summarized why he did it, how he did it, and, and the, the, the device that he introduced. And that was a genuine invention. And now I want to shift meta language now. So at the time, he was considering the lambda calculus, which he called applicative expressions. And nowadays, JavaScript tends to be the, pro the programming language which is, well, running by default on, 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 in the browser. No, I, I, I learned JavaScript by writing this paper, so this is all brand new for me. Uh, so I'm not pro pro saying that JavaScript is great, I'm just taking it as is. And the surprising thing is that there is one implementation of JavaScript, which is called Rhino, which provides, and I have to admire that, continuations objects. And continuation object looks much cooler than first class continuations, somehow. Anyway, they have it. So at the scheme workshop last year, John Clements explained which kind of continuation objects they have. And the continuation is not the current continuation, it's the continuation of the caller. That's the something funny which is happening. So call CC, as used in Scheme or ML or wherever, is called call with current continuation. So you grab the current continuation, you bind it, you pass it to a function, and life goes on. If you ever apply it, you'll come back where you are. But here, the, the way uh, Rhino offers continuation objects, it's the continuation of the caller of the current method. And that has to do with lowly allocations of resource for the current methods, spilling registers or, or whatever. And uh, hearing that, uh, I was stunned because that's exactly what the J operator was doing. The J operator in the encoding of Algol 60 was capturing the, call, the continuation of the caller. So one more time. There was a machine that he invented at the time called the SECD machine, which you must have heard of. So stack environment control and dump. And the control was basically the, all the control stack for the current lambda. And the D was all the saving for the caller of the lambda. And what J did was to capture the dump. So it's like snatch the current dump, exactly like here. So it seems like a thing to try to see whether if we were to use exactly this feature of J, which is to capture the continuation of the caller, we could just reproduce his encoding from Adol 60 to JavaScript and then see whether it works at all and what lesson we can, we can draw from that. Okay, so if we look at JavaScript as a target language and we would like, uh, and we would like to embed a language into JavaScript, well, a lot of people have looked at it for continuation passing style and it's very hard because in continuation passing style, all calls are tail calls. And so you can't use the, the, or you have serious encoding issues because JavaScript is not properly recursive. So maybe you could look with selective CPS transformation where you only 
uh, introduce continuation when you really, really need them. But that's, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, you know what a tail call is? So um, in Scheme, for example, there is no mechanism for iteration. There is no while loop. Instead, you define a tail, a tail recursive function and, and all the iteration is done by tail recursion. And a properly tail recursive implementation is the requirement on any implementation of Scheme. And what it says is that for any, teleco for any looping or iterating program, you should not run out of resource. So that's what properly tail recursive means. It was all uh, developed and formalized into a paper by Will Klinger at PLDI in 1998 called proper tail recursion and space efficiency. Okay? So the issue of tail calls is hitting everybody. Everybody is trying r really hard to obtain that and, and it hurts. So maybe you could, okay, go selective CPS and then reduce the pain. But that's, as Mao Tse Tung said, that's a mechanism, that's not a solution. Well, things like this is so for you. Trace Monkey or other JavaScript implementations. I'm thinking Trace uh -huh. Monkey would do tail calls. Okay, so uh, in general, so anyway, it's very painful. So we, we, I'll, I'll leave it at that. The, 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 it's known to be painful. There have been lots of clever papers to encode in various virtual machines a properly tail recursive language, especially if it has first class continuations. But, but, but it's painful, okay? Is it painful because you want to retain the, the debugging information so you can get the, the call tracks? I mean, doing the jump is no problem. That's, that's true. The Simon Payton Jones has been uh, struggling to make the, 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 well, any of the virtual machine uh, properly tail recursive. But the problem is one of insecurity across modules. So you want to remember some information. And so intra-modules, tail recursion is achievable. Inter-modules, not. And, and that's, that's the issue. So here we have the option of no, no CPS at all and using a control operator instead. And then we thought, well, we should just try and see how well it works. So the job was to retarget the embedding of Algol 60 from the lambda calculus to JavaScript with J. And that was, now you understand every word in the title. So J is for JavaScript is upon, okay? It's just a coincidence. But the correspondence is now in direct style. That means there is no encoding of anything. Everything is really direct. Okay, so it's Algol-like language because we didn't take full Algol with own and uh, lots, of, lots of things. We just restricted it to lexically, blo lexical block with, uh, with uh, free variables. Okay, so Algol-like language and JavaScript and then our, our modus operandi, our enabling technologies for access continuations. Or continuation objects, really. So now it's beautiful because declarations translate to declarations. Blocks translate to blocks, commands translate to commands, function calls translate to function calls, and all the lexical structure is just inherited into JavaScript. So the idea would be, or was for us, to see how much the idioms of Algol could be reflected in JavaScript, and then what extra stuff we need to do to encode the non-standard stuff. So here, we map a label declaration to J, uh, to capture a continuation, and we uh, translate a jump into a call to a continuation that was captured. And modulo, it's explained in the paper, s some kind of evil, uh, well, e evil things that happen in JavaScript, which is a little bit ugly in the corner, uh, where we need to do something so that the stack doesn't explode. So it's, the world is ugly in, in some corners. So except for that ugly corner, where well, we needed to adjust the, the translation so that it wouldn't loop, the whole thing is, is a success. So I discovered with complete surprise that if you take the knuth morrison pratt henning it only has backward jumps. All the generated programs by the knuth morrison pratt string matching algorithm incur backward jumps. And when you think about it hard, you say, well, yes, of course, but that was a surprise. And then we took, uh, so that was the occasion to read all the good, good old papers, like Structured Programming with GoTo by uh, Knuth in the 60s, 
So we took his version of quicksort with GoTo's and then we made it work. We tried uh, programs where, where there are so-called outward jumps, where you use jumps to escape, uh, like exceptions. Uh, and then we also uh, tried with coroutines, such as infringe or transducing streams, etc. And then skipping a little bit, or jumping a little bit out, we even tried Knuth man or boy test, which was a test that he devised to check whether your, your Algol compiler is, is a real guy. Can it really handle that? But that one is more about how to handle lexical scope properly and efficiently rather than anything else. Be it as it may, our compiler passes the Knuth's man or boy test. So, okay, so this is what we have done. Okay, so now I would like to share with you the lessons that, 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 that we took. Okay, so it's a very general observation that compilers are geared for programs that people write. So, for example, in OCaml, uh, you're welcome to write functions up to seven parameters and the compiler will implement them efficiently. But if you want more, tough luck, uh, the, the, it's going to be slower. And as someone who wrote partial evaluators, I have seen that generating program and then giving them to a compiler, the, well, these programs are not the kind of program that people will write by hand and they are not processed efficiently. So once uh, in Pellmell with Nevin Heinz and Kaunin Melchier, we had uh, a program that generated so like 50, 60 mutually recursive equations with 30 to 40 parameters each. And that was enough to completely choke standard name of New Jersey. So I asked Andrew Appel, why? And, and then he said, ah, that's normal because my register allocation routine is not linear in the number of parameters. And so we just gave it uh, 40 parameters and it just died. So compilers are geared for programs that people write. And in fact, that's also true for analysis. Uh, the, the people analyze programs that, well, people would write. That's the common case. But the, 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 the situation becomes different if programs are generated, because then we, we go out of that, that kind of boundaries. So that's, that's the bad news. The good news is that we know how they are generated, because we are the one who generate them. So uh, the, the, the next step would be gearing any kind of analyzers or compilers towards the kind of programs that are generated, template-like, if you like. Another example would be uh, that, uh, well, the middle ground that we should seek is, well, if we only use outward jumps, well, there is no need to use full-fledged continuations because there is a programming language construct that handles that. It's called exceptions, okay? And and so, similarly, a lot of the things that would incur a little bit of encoding often can be expressed using a linguistic feature of the target language. And so, that's the, that's the two big conclusions that we draw. And now what we are doing is to looking at how, well, what are the idioms that we, that we write? Or to, what are the typical idiom that one would write in the domain-specific language? And how do they reflect in the target language? And how can we exploit uh, that structure to handle it better or, or, or predict things better or analyzing things more efficiently? Just because they are not geared for what people write, they are geared for the kind of programs that are generated. So we ambitiously call that towards common JavaScript, just like it was called common Lisp uh, a long time ago, minus the huge size. But the official, the, our, F, our explicit target is... Uh, to, f divide, to well, restrict, design, study, specify uh, a common JavaScript that would be the explicit translation target for domain-specific languages. And then the various kinds of embeddings that we, that we uh, enumerated would have to have a nice support or an, a, a nice thing like that, which is the end of my simple talk. I'll be happy to take questions. differences do you have in mind between current JavaScript and current JavaScript? Oh, um, well, JavaScript has lots of dark corners. 
uh, you declare a variable and then it, 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 you can declare a variable in the middle of a block and then it was like if you had declared it at the beginning of the block and that kind of things. Uh, so it's, it's more confusing than helpful. So, so, well, it's a little bit by analogy with like the GNU project where I was very impressed once when I saw a talk and I saw the incredible discipline that all the GNU programmers have when they write C. It's incredibly disciplined and, and there is nothing else but social pressure. So here, if we could codify that, 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 this, this structure to exploit it downstream, uh, that was the idea. Now what we would like, it's more wishful than, than, than anything else at this point, but for the language that we would like to embed, we would like that if there is an idiom that, that, that works in the target language, that should be the one which is used to encode a feature of the, of the source language. If there is uh, something which we need to code, then that code should be minimized on so that it doesn't interfere with other features. So that would be the ideal world of, 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 a, of a target language where th there is no dark corner, there is no way to code your way around and, and hide things and make things ultimately inefficient. And I've read papers on, that analyze JavaScript and they all make these kind of assumptions. Academics complain a lot about this full declaration of laws in JavaScript. For example? Although in practice, I think that particular group has been. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there are other. Well, okay, I'm not the JavaScript expert, uh, but my co authors are, especially my PhD student, Jan, and um, he, he showed me some rather frightening examples which are in the paper, which is on my webpage. So, so um, the way we needed to code something so that the stack would not explode, uh, well, that's something that I would never want to write by hand, but I'm, then, I'm happy that the, that the code generator does for me. And then the pattern is so clear that, that, that any uh, further processor can take advantage of it. So it, it's simple-minded. Sorry, I have another question. I really Please. wanted to see the meat of some translations. Uh, okay, the, the simplest. Okay, I didn't want. I usually put lots of code on my slides, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> today. Yeah, they came between slides twenty and twenty-one. Yes. I think there were eight slides that I wanted to see. Okay, uh, it would be simpler if I just if we just go together on a couple of pages in the paper. The paper has has a solid half of that. So so the half of the paper is code. And, and, and translation from one to the other with little drawings and analysis of what goes where. So it's to the point that we don't even have a BNF of the, uh, of the subset of Algol that we consider. We have the image, so we have a BNF in JavaScript of the image, which we can do because it's a homomorphic translation. So, so there is lots of code in the paper. I'll be happy to show it to you now. Um, in my home page. So, so the, the oh, I'm sorry. It has been published in lecture note in computer science. Uh, okay, the, at some number, it was in Oxford in July. It was published. It was presented at Oxford two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in the IFIP working conference on domain-specific languages. It's published. Okay. It's in Springer Verlag, NCS something. And, yeah. and I can give, I have a copy here if you want it. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.